Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Howdy, what can I do for you? I'm here to ship some things back to China. Okay, we can do that. Shipping things back, eh? Have you lived there before? Yeah, I lived there for three years and came back two years ago. Now I'm going back to start my own business. Really? Did you ship things with us last time? No, I used a Chinese shipping agency. Well, I'll just let you know that rates have changed recently, so I don't know if they'll be comparable to what you pay before. It doesn't matter to me. My company's paying for it. Aha! Then it's nothing off your skin, right? Okay. I'll need your name and where you need to go to pick up the items to be shipped. My name is Scott Linder, L I N D E R, and I live in upstate New York, Saratoga Springs. Oh, sure. I know that place. I go to the races there. Great town. What's the zip there again? Double seven o four two five, and the street address is four one two West Lake Road. Double seven o four two five West Lake. Got it. And how big of a container are you going to be looking for? Well, I didn't have a container last time, and I don't think I'll need one this time. I think that I'll have about six cubic meters. We can get a subsection of a container then. How big is that? It's two meters wide and three meters long. Two meters high, right? Yes, sir. Now look at questions six to ten. As the talk continues, answer questions six to ten. And for customs, I need to know what sort of items will you be shipping. Mostly furniture, but we'll also have quite a few boxes of books too. Any clothing? Nope, but we'll have some bicycles and wood that we use for a loft bed. Be careful with those bicycles. I hear bicycle theft is a big problem in China. Not if you know how to secure your bikes and where to store them. Well, good luck. How valuable do you want me to list the entire shipment as being? Let's say about three and a half thousand dollars. Great. Now you'll also have to go over to the customs department to check with them about shipping the wood over to China. I know there are concerns about termites, bugs, etc. No problem. It's the same wood I brought over from China last time. Then you should be okay. It's just a formality. And last of all, where would you like the shipment to be delivered? Well, I will live in Beijing, but let's ship it to Tianjin. My company will pick it up there. That's all right then. Have a nice trip. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone. Now here you all are, new university students, and the first question you probably have is, "What is a student union?" Another question is, 
Do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded. So, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left, and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints, and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question: What are we? We are a formal organization, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises, and organize ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well. The student union organized all the festivities at the end of that, the barbecues, partying and drinking, and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions, and as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three: social, organizational, and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear. In other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to twenty percent discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue. If you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. 
Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Helen and her tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in. Ah, it's you, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, it's about that essay on nonverbal communication. I'd like a bit of advice, if that's all right. By all means. That's what I'm here for. How can I help you? Um, it's about that survey you asked us to carry out about body language. Oh, yes. I asked you to investigate what sort of touching is permissible between friends of the same sex and friends of the opposite sex. That's it. And then you wanted us to go on to compare the answers we obtained from people from our own culture with the answers of people from other cultures. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult. There are students here from dozens of cultures, including Asia and the Middle East. Go and ask them. That's the problem. I'm not sure how to word the questions. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Go and ask them. That's the problem. I'm not sure how to word the questions. I think I've got far too many. People don't want to be bothered answering them all. Is that the list of questions you have with you? Let's have a look. Hmm, I see. Your basic idea is fine. You've got a checklist of the parts of the body we mostly use to touch people with and a checklist of the parts of other people's bodies that we usually touch. But you don't have to go right through the list asking a separate question about each item. You can make your questionnaire much shorter if you ask open questions. Open questions? What are they? Sometimes we call them WH questions. What, when, where. Those are examples. Oh, I see. Yes. We learned about them in grammar. I hadn't realised how useful they'd turn out to be. I could just ask one open question about each subject and tick the answers I receive. That's right. Now, let's have a look at the list of parts of the body you're going to ask about. Um, I see. You've got the head, arm and hand and, oh, it's over the page, the back, leg and foot. What about the shoulder and the thigh? They're important areas, and there are some others you should include too. Oh yes, of course. I was in a rush and forgot those. Um, 
What about asking people how they feel about being touched? Surely, it's hard for people to put that sort of feeling into words. Yes, you're right. That's why it's essential to work out a rating scale for each response. Can you tell me a bit about how to use rating scales? Well, there's no way to measure how strongly a person feels about something. Of course, all we can go on is what they report about their feelings. So what we do is offering them choices of ways to express how they feel: very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That would be an example of a rating scale. In this case, as your survey is only a small trial sample. I suggest you use that three-point rating scale I've just described: very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That'll be enough to enable you to draw some broad conclusions. You may go on to refine your survey later if you decide to specialise in the study of non-verbal aspects of behaviour. Thank you. I'm much clearer now. Could I ask you one last question? I'm afraid I've got a brain like a sieve, but I just can't remember the technical term you told us for the study of touch. It sounded like happy, but of course it isn't. Oh, you mean haptics? H a p t i c s. Of course, haptics. That's it. Happy to be of service. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the twentieth century, while Lincoln lived in the nineteenth century. Kennedy was born in nineteen seventeen, whereas Lincoln was born more than one hundred years earlier. In 1809, as for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947.
They went to the Congress just one hundred years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number six zero. Lincoln was elected President in eighteen sixty, and Kennedy was elected in nineteen sixty. Furthermore, both men were president during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was president during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only one thousand days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, a few days after the end of the American Civil War. It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States. And the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four.